Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scene tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome back to another special episode of Inside the Firm. This is the homeowners edition. Episode two. Episode two. Uh, I am your co-host, Alex Gore. I'm here with the main host, Lance Psycho. He loves being promoted in titles. And we're here with Lindsay Fox, our other host. Last episode, we talked about uh, what homeowners can ask and look for when they're approaching an architect. This episode, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the nuts and bolts of, of how it actually gets done and what's the differences between the programs and, and how it gets done. Um, and just to tee it off, I think the first assumption is people see things on television and they think that that's what's going to happen and occur. So Lindsay, do you have a take on that? Uh, well, on television, you get lots of renderings of what your project is going to be and how, you know, you're going to have cabinets flying into this empty space, this vanilla box, and then you're going to get to like have the cabinet, the countertops overlay on top of it and you get to see it all. Um, I've been to uh, the construction conferences and I've spoken to uh, the service professionals that are offering those capabilities and that's all post-production folks. It's not like you, as a homeowner, you can typically expect that to get that level of visualization throughout your design process. And moving into this industry, I was kind of saying, why not? You know, are, is it possible to have my design process coupled with all of these really great visualization tools? Um, and sadly, I discovered that they do kind of exist but it's not like they're broadly um, adopted. And that's how we met each other is because I was looking for, for that capability. Yeah. And, and, and I think what you just described to kind of clarify it for the audience is what Lindsay described is the difference between a, a static set of visualization tools. Now we can move our models around and stuff like that, but it's not going to be this dynamic presentation. So you can't, it's not fair to expect this dynamic presentation where we literally are showing, we press a button, we bring you into our office, we press a button on our computer and on the, on the screen, it shows a house being built in, in virtual real time. That's, that's the biggest, that's, I think that's the best way to kind of describe that. And, and the reason why, so I think we'll go into the visualizations that you can have, but to have it do that whole sequence, just for one presentation and then know that you're making design decisions. So you're changing that. And then they have to go back in the software to make everything go together. I think you're literally wasting your money um, because it, it's economical to do that at the end, but not in the middle, but there are kind of levels of software. Um, and Lance, what are those levels and what are the programs kind of in those levels? And then Lindsay, we'll kind of talk to you then about what those produce. Yeah. Yeah, that's a perfect segue into that. <clears throat> I think Lindsay's a, uh, will be a great way, way to explain what you can get out of these different various things as she's an expert. So let's just peel it back uh, and go back in time a little bit, right? We have this, there's this word that's still thrown around and it, and it drives architects and designers nuts um, because we, 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 we really pride ourselves on using, you know, correct language uh, when it pertains to anything, and that's blueprints. Well, how are the blueprints produced? hand drafting. Uh, there are still people out there that do hand drafted documents. I think you just had some come in. The other uh, yeah, day. that's what, I, yep. I saw the, I mentioned it last uh, podcast, but I, I saw them and it blew my mind. And the reason why it blew my mind is because <clears throat> in high school, I was using uh, AutoCAD. And then the last year I decided to hand draft it because it would be the last time I could do a full set. And in high school, we did a full set. It took me twice as long. All my friends were doing, my designs were obviously better. That's clearly, that's clear, right? But everyone else was producing the same amount of stuff. And then I had to come in at literally like six in the morning. I had to stay till like seven at night all the time 
just to get my hand drafting done. The teacher somehow stayed and opened the door. So bravo to, to my teacher. So it is very, very unproductive to do it hand drafting style. Um, and we, and we can talk about why the, the other things about uh, it, it, that should, it, if you're a homeowner looking for an architect and you see them hand drafting, hand drafting specifically what, what they're going to submit to the permit documentation office, what they're going to submit um, for construction documents. It's okay if you're sketching by hand still, we do that all the time. But if the final documents are done by hand, that, is, that should be a red flag. It should be a red flag because uh, the we've evolved as designers and the amount of, uh, uh, like, like Alex said, building the model as you are gonna build it in the field that, that's a true reflection of where we're at now with the software and how it's evolved. So the amount of mistakes that are possible with a hand drafted set versus a, a, a drawing set that's done with the most sophisticated software out there right now that, we, that we're using, major difference. And, and to give an analogy, you can choose that architect. Just know that you are paying for his time to do that. Just like today, you can choose a rocket that doesn't land and get reused and just blows up in the sky. Well, not blows up, but just kind of falls in the ocean. But you're going to pay a lot more for a reusable rocket for a one that doesn't get reused than one that does. So just, <laughs> I know that was a stretch, but like it can be done. I but think you're always trying to add in space analogies to everything you do. You yeah, I have to. I have to. Totally out to space all the time. <laughs> People can choose a technology that is cost more and doesn't do as much. Happens all the time but you just don't need to these days. Yeah. Uh, the next level up from there is AutoCAD. And the, Alex already kind of mentioned that word. And so what AutoCAD is, oh, every homeowner should know is, AutoCAD for us specifically means as designers, you should just know this is that we don't use it in the general sense. And I think the public uses that in a general sense where they say, oh, they're just gonna use AutoCAD. There's a big difference between AutoCAD and BIM slash 3D products like Revit, like uh, like SolidWorks, like Bentley Systems and stuff like that. So the AutoCAD will make your architect more productive or your designer more productive, sure. And Alex already talked about that with his analogy. Of, hand drafting. Yep, yep. But there's still a big gap between the AutoCAD sets of drawings that you'll get and the BIM drawings that you'll get in terms of your risk as an owner of, of a lot of unknowns, a lot of things that are not virtually modeled and figured out before. So the final tier and where we're at right now is building information modeling. And maybe you can unpeel for, what is that, what, what is building information modeling, Lindsay? Uh, if, if we're homeowners, if you're talking to us like homeowners, and then what do you use for, to do, to do your work? Right, so uh, moving out of my uh, previous role as like a uh, parent to my child and wanting to move into a new career path that was construction based, um, I, I went hunting for what tools uh, designers are using to manifest my construction documents, knowing that my construction documents had a direct effect on the efficiency of my building process. And so I've written a, a post and it lives on our website, uh, your design software matters. How do you successfully uh, communicate to a potential uh, architect or designer that you're hiring um, that, that can communicate that, you, that you're looking for a different type of process? So hand drafting, yes, pencil on paper. One of my favorite lines from Alex was, if you just need some lines on paper, you need to hire someone else. That's not what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing is making sure that our designs get constructed. Um, when you move into AutoCAD, which originally the initials were uh, computer-aided drafting, it's since moved into computer-aided design. Um, and it's come a long way. And you even have some 3D uh, visualization capabilities within AutoCAD software. Uh, and move into building information modeling, I think what's really unique uh, that most people don't understand is when you're in AutoCAD and you need to draw a floor plan for your client, and then you need to draw an elevation. So an elevation is that vertical perspective, like if I'm standing in a room, floor plans is if you're looking down on a room. 
that I have to go through and redraw what that vertical view looks like. Uh, and so each view that you're seeing on your construction documents is drawn. And most uh, professionals, even builders, don't understand, oh, just give me a cross section so that I can see uh, where that tub is supposed to be. You know, that's something that we were laughing about earlier. Uh, what we're doing with building information modeling is you're creating a whole component system. It's a 3D structure. So instead of drawing each view, you're slicing through a three-dimensional object and extracting a view. And so your design process can happen, we can say three times faster, but it can be 10 times faster. Just being able to slice through the design versus manifesting a drawing of what you imagine that vertical perspective to look like. Uh, and that's what I needed in the, in the market. And that's what I wasn't finding. And that's, you know, the root of founding Tiverbuilt and meeting you guys was looking for this building information modeling approach to design. Yeah. Okay. One key that I think is critical. So in, in AutoCAD, you can put a dimension on and then you can change that dimension irrespective to whether it is correct or not. I actually remember doing this in, in school. Revit doesn't allow you to do that. If you put a dimension, you can add like notes to it, but it is the real dimension. And the reason why I bring that up is because a building was literally getting built that was drawn in AutoCAD. And they were walking through the, the owner and the contractor walking through just a, and this is a three-story multi-residence uh, building. And they go, the hallways feel kind of small here, like the main corridor hallway. And they went and it said that it was supposed to be five feet. And then they measured it and it was like four feet two, something like that. And then they looked at the drawings and the architect just changed the dimension. Like the text. The text and not the actual. So it didn't work out. You know, like there's only, there's walls. It, it, this was built in Denver. Everyone builds to the property lines and all that. that like they had to shrink things. It was just terrible. Uh, a, a similar thing happened where, when you're talking about things being all connected, um, they change the height of something in, in section, right? Because this is all independent in AutoCAD, but they didn't change it in elevation where the bulk plane was. So all of a sudden mm. they're breaking bulk plane heights. They're making their building too big because they only did it one place, not another place. And sorry to go on a rant, but that's why like literally on the architect's test, it used to say, I don't know if they deleted this question or not, but it's uh, where should you put information? And they're like, oh, only put it once because then you only have to change it once rather than multiple times. And like with today's technology, I laugh at that. I laugh at that because if it's so easy to put it on all the sheets because it's, because it's generated in 3D and it's linked. So if you move a dimension in section, it's going to move in, in floor plan. Why are you hiding information for them to go find it? Like, oh, they decided only to put it on the floor plan. Now that's where me as a GC has to look. Now I'm even more grumpy because these plans suck. Who, um, and then now the owner's mad at me because time delays because that just happens in construction. Who am I going to blame as the GC? I'm going to start to blame the architect. Yeah. And this is where that adversarial relationship gets started and, and, and why it gets started. And I think we're kind of talking about why it's what, justified. I think it's justified. I agree. Yeah. Like, agree. like, like if you're an architect still hand drafting or using AutoCAD, you deserve the brow beating because you haven't evolved like the rest of us and, <laughs> and moved into a building information modeling piece of software. So uh, one of the, one, one, I had a two part question for you, Lindsay. So I'll just, te I'll just kind of round back to that for the homeowners listening. <clears throat> You should be demanding that your designers, your architects, your structural engineers are using building information modeling software. There's three big ones. Uh, Revit, that's what we use. Uh, Tiber uses it. That's what F9 uses. Um, and that's what, and then, and then you, there's um, uh, Archicad and then um, Vectorworks. So that those, if you're in a homeowner, you should be demanding. It doesn't matter. It honestly doesn't matter what software they use. We obviously prefer Revit. Uh, we, it just, it works for us. It's the way to go. It's probably 80% of architects use it. There you go. The so. majority of us architects use it. You could, you could put it in that context. That use bin. But if you're a homeowner, you need to be asking and demanding that you're, that the architect designer, whatever you, you choose is 
is using building information modeling software because they are model they are virtually modeling your project before it's built there it's a, that's a way to virtually test the whole thing and then it's a way for everything to be linked like Lindsay was saying from floor plan to vertical you know elevations and sections so that so that everything is there the, the you're reducing the amount of human error right so if if everybody's watching this and right between these two is if out if on this right hand side is hand drafting and this other side is uh, 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 BIM look at the there's a big gap of error that could happen as soon as you get between AutoCAD and BIM and if you're just a BIM very small amount of space for human error um, that could result in thousands of dollars of extra costs because contractors love uh, to do change orders. Yes. Oh, and fair warning to homeowners, uh, when you're doing competitive bid uh, with your plans, it's the lack of detail in your plans that open you up to getting major swings in your pricing proposals. So when you're trying to figure out, oh, do I go with the lowest bid? Do I go with the highest bid? Do I pick the middle? It's the level of detail that, that influences how much, uh, how big the span is between, between your quotes. And one of the things that uh, drove me towards uh, building information modeling with a Revit-based system was I wasn't in this industry to create pieces of paper. I'm in this industry to construct. I'm in this industry to create amazing spaces for our clients because that's the fun stuff. That's how you, that's the payoff for all of the hard work in the early phases. And so when you're approaching your architect designer and you're saying, what's in your toolbox? What software are you using? The sidecar question to that is, does that software empower me to have a more efficient and cost-effective building experience? And where the industry is moving is that previously it was very siloed. It was bifurcated. It was like, here's design and here's construction. And it was adversarial and it was... Uh, um, difficult to navigate and you found yourself like in the midst of negotiations where you've got a builder saying, I can't figure out what is this supposed to look like? And then you as an owner trying to like ping pong back to the architect saying, Oh, what is this, you know, what is this uh, ceiling system going to be? And yep. that's where, that's where this building information modeling is going to be homeowner driven. But Lindsay, you used that word again and I loved it. Fun. I, you just made me think of another uh, thing that a homeowner should be thinking of. There's an added, all these added benefits with building information modeling, demanding that your architect uses a 3D piece of software to, to do their drawings. You, you mentioned that it, it becomes fun for you. So then it's going to become fun for them, right? And, and what it reminds me of, of, like, think about how much, how, if you're an owner and you're asking your architect or designer to make a, giant change. Like I want, instead of my example would be, I want my main floor to be, now I want it to be 10 feet tall instead of eight feet tall. That is an, if you've modeled correctly in Revit, that is an easy change for you. You're not dreading it as the designer. It's still a fun process for you. And then it's going to fold that all back in. Thought so? Yeah. I mean, I think that was a great thought. Separate from that is I think the homeowner should ask. I've never been put on the spot with this question, but I think it would be valid. And especially if you're choosing between different architects, it's for them to say, hey, can you show me an example set? And have them show it on the computer or pull it up because not only would I show, I thought, how would I answer that? I'd pull up a set and then I would immediately open up the Revit program and start to show them sheets and then go to a 3D view and then show them how that works and how it's all connected and really rotate around the models, you know, and explain everything. That will be a huge tell. If that you can walk in, if you're interviewing three firms, say, can you show me an example set? And then just see, do they just leave it on paper? Does the paper, exp you know, like, is it clear? If you know Eric Reinholdt's 30 by 40 design workshop, like his examples of plans are probably the clearest ones ever. What is that going to do? That's going to help the contractor and the owner understand what's going on, which is going to lower costs, reduce time and create for, a, you know, a better, more fun, fun process. If they open the set and it's this, messy nonsense and all you see is lines and there's not clear communication 
and it's maybe four pages long. Um, I think people are Fresh visual legs. and, and I'm almost rethinking yeah. like our, our presentation process and, you know, as we're talking, <laughs> but I, I, I think you would be able to tell more if you looked at an actual set between a couple different architects. Yep. It, it, well, it, it reminds me of your, what you were saying earlier about, and no wonder there's all these, um, Lindsay, it reminds me of what you were saying earlier. It reminds me of, of uh, all these articles about how to survive the process, like mentally prepare for chronic chaos. Like, oh my God, that, that, that's exactly why those articles exist. Yeah. yeah. And I, every homeowner needs to know this really annoying phrase. It's a uh, bi-directional associativity. And it's the we're, ability. <laughs> we're homeowners right now. T tell us. What did you just say? Why did you say I it? I don't understand. Why did no, you assault like, why? <laughs> This is the challenge of uh, making technology digestible to the common consumer. Bidirectional associativity means that when a change is made in one view, the any other view relevant to that change changes also. So when I move a ceiling up and as a designer using BIM software, the bi-directional associativity is that every other view that was impacted by that change manifests and updates automatically. Yep. So bi-directional associativity is this breakthrough. But if any owner went to an architect and said, the software you're using, does it have the capabilities of bi-directional associativity? You know, just crickets. Nobody understands. Yeah, that's and a $10 then, word that we didn't even know. You got to pay a lot. <laughs> To use that Two word, words. Um, but it's I, I laugh because I have friends at Autodesk, and I said, "Why do you make me use this word? Uh, <laughs> this word is hard and cumbersome. I can't market it, but it is everything to ensuring that your uh, design to construction process is successful. It's how you make sure that uh, there's not going to be clashes between." what is drawn on the outside of the building and what exists on the inside of the building. Yeah. Profound. Um, I, I, I can't agree more. I think that's great, you know, production overview of, of what a BIM can BIM software can do for you. I think there's some add-ons or some different things on the front end and then in the back end. what technology, let's say we are doing addition, what technology is useful you know, for bringing in something that already exists into that digital world. And then when you're making something new, what technology exists to show the client of that new thing that's going to happen in the future? Um, so I can thank Apple because LIDAR is becoming more common in the vernacular. So LIDAR is just that technology of light bouncing back to something and being able to register a measurement using that light. Um, so 3D laser scanning is a key to unlocking building information modeling for uh, an existing building. So it's great when you are building in Revit or using building information modeling, a new construction, as the design comes together, you can feel confident that you've got bi-directional associativity and that your views on the inside and outside are gonna match. When you get into laser scanning, uh, that kind of unlocks building information modeling for an existing condition. So I have a house, I wanna add an addition, or I need to take down a structural wall. Uh, that's when you're doing a 360 laser scan. You have individual locations for each scan. They all stitch together. And the reason we picked Revit as our software of choice is because Revit can digest that template of an existing structure. And we use that template to create a digital model of the existing structure. Cool. Uh, and then I, I think also presenting to clients. So they are visual people. Drawings are just drawings sometimes. We use a program, I think you use it too. It's a plugin, it's called Enscape. And what that basically allows you to do is, is have the same user interface and controls that you would have if you were playing a game online and being able to walk through. So since you already created everything in Revit and it is to scale and it does have volume, it has floors, walls, all that, this program then allows, going back almost to the original of, you know, don't expect what's on TV, but there is that, this caveat that 
firms can produce a walkthrough so that you can get a feel for the volume for the space and apply materials too if, if you're at that stage. And that's a question to ask is, um, what do you deliver? You know, that's what a client can ask. And they could just say, hey, we just deliver sets of drawings, right? It's now appropriate for them to say, we, uh, we deliver sets of drawings, but also a 3D model that you can walk through. Do you, Lindsay, have you, do you think that designers and architects are um, basically holding themselves hostage with the idea that they have implanted in their head. I don't know if you've heard this from other design professionals, but that they are afraid to show people these wonderful 3D models that we've built in the computer that are either rendered realistically or not. They can just kind of be sort of a cartoony look. You can put that in your head and think about it that way. Uh, that they're holding themselves hostage because they think that if we show up the clients that and we show the homeowners that, that they think they are, they are going to think they're predicting that the homeowners are going to say, oh, this is the final product for me. I have no design input. Do you think that's a fallacy? Because, uh, can you comment on that? Yeah. So what Enscape is, is it's a real-time rendering engine. So what is existing in the Revit file is getting pushed and pulled back and forth through this portal. And what's what that means is when you create a building information model and you take it into this real-time rendering environment, what exists in the model exists in the image. And I feel like the industry, when they're creating, so in years previous, you could say that rendering was a static experience. You know, you could go to an architect and say, I need a, I can't picture this from floor plan view can you draw a 3D perspective of what this room is gonna look like for me? And what's beautiful about the architectural mind is that their ability to imagine a three-dimensional space and translate it onto a piece of paper is profound. It's, there's a proficiency there. But when you're the owner and you're taking the risk uh, of, of this very expensive endeavor, relying on some imagination is not, it's not how you build confidence. Because while an architect or designer can thoughtfully imagine what a room looks like, that doesn't mean that my builder is going to be imagining it the same way the architect had. And so where we have real-time rendering tools, it means what exists in the documents that will create my construction set is going to be the same building information model that I get to walk through. And so what we've referred to it as is single source BIM enabled project planning. It's another really cumbersome thing to say, but it's the single source BIM and you're enabled, you're all empowered. Um, and that means that your architectural professionals, your design professionals, your build professionals, and you as the owner have consistency. It's a single source where you all get to look at the same thing and know, oh, that's that's what I'm supposed to build. That's what I want to build. That's what I want to do to pay me to design for you. And that's where it's so exciting to move into this construction industry and design industry as like a cohesive uh, unit versus the bifurcation that existed previously. Yeah. And, and what I've noticed, so Enscape is really kind of leveled up. I think a lot of us who, who, who use it. Um, so I, I just want to reassure the homeowners that are listening is that because because it's an, an enable us to level up, um, what that means is we can start making real time changes and show you the differences between models and and the, so that the, you use the word dynamic. It used to be static, but now we have this dynamic workflow, and so it can be fluid and it still continues to be fun because we're also not expending you know, 20, 40, 50, 60 crazy amount of time and, and hours just producing that still image. Like for instance, when Alex and I were in, in college um, way back when, <clears throat> like over a decade ago, you, you basically had to have a, a mini supercomputer and then you would, you would set it up and hit the F9 button and then you'd, you'd render overnight and it would take forever. So kind of like that analogy of if you are if you're working with an architect that's using AutoCAD or, BIM or uh, AutoCAD or uh, hand drafting, imagine how painful it's going to be. They're going to dread a change. But if you're working with an architect or a designer who's using BIM and Enscape, 
they're going to, the, the change is expected and they're ready and they have the tools and they can make those dynamic changes. So all the way through the process, it is a fun, dynamic, back and forth process, enjoyable for you, the homeowner, if you're selecting people who are using um, those tools. And, and also, if you're following the, the process of what I would say is correctly is that you're getting the floor plan done and the massing done in schematic design. Then the next phase you're doing um, more materials and, and figuring out all the details that are going into that. Your Enscape or 3D model experience can mimic that and it should mimic that. Meaning if you are giving a model in schematic design for them to walk through, it should be quote unquote white box. There shouldn't be a bunch of materials on there. You aren't at that level of making those choices. It should just be spatial awareness, massing and, and things like that. And then wait for the design development to add those materials once those decisions have been made. And that will more easily allow the client to step into that process of, hey, this isn't a finished you know, product. It's clearly evolving as we go through the phases. And I do like that with, with this new approach is the fluid and open uh, design approach. And as a design professional, I think you guys can relate. There's very often that you are asked as from a client to make a change that you as a designer don't actually want, that you don't actually support. Um, and I've gotten such accolades from our clients because I will present something, a client will want me to like manifest some of their ideas. And so I do, and I can do it in real time and it can be rendered in real time. And it's just very flattering when a client says, thank you for showing me your, the idea I wanted to see. I don't like it. I really like what you had done for me. Uh, let's go back to that. And I hit delete and we start our virtual tour we go into different spaces and it's just this really open uh, dialogue between a design professional, a professional that's building confidence with their client versus a controlled set where the architect or designer said, here's, here's what I made for you, here's the bill. Um, and creating that open fun experience where, where it's collaborative works for both sides, homeowner and designer. Yep. Everybody's empowered at that point. Everybody's working most efficiently. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't know if I could think of a better uh, process. I mean, obviously maybe there will be one of more evolution where we have like the table we're sitting on and we can actually pull the model up and do all kinds of dynamic stuff. But for, for right now, it's, it's, it's fairly close to that just with a mouse and a keyboard. Yep. And then um, here, here's a process. This is for the discerning homeowners that list that are listening. And if you can, piece this out, I think it's going to be very, very valuable to you. And it's a little bit nitty gritty is what softwares are you using and how does the process go? And this goes back to what you said, your fancy three word, one word, single source. What was that, Lindsay? Single source BIM enabled. Single source Project BIM enabled. So I recently on Twitter saw a graph and it was the phases of the architecture process. And it said, the loss of knowledge through those phases. I was like, what hmm. is this graph? And it was schematic design. You know, you have all this knowledge. And then when you go to design development, you lose some, and then you have to rebuild that back up. And then you go through that phase and then construction documents, you lose some and you build that back up. And the problem is, and why that graph even exists is because people aren't having a single source for their information. Meaning <clears throat> I know firms for a fact do this. They will start schematic design in SketchUp. And they will get that schematic design to actually a pretty detailed level. And then they will start the design development and they will have to transfer and remodel that whole model into Revit. So that's that loss of knowledge. And then all of a sudden, some firms have, and I know this to be true too, then they have a construction document template. So then they have to take that design development mm -hmm. document and put it into a construction template and then they lose stuff again. No, no, they are literally wasting time and knowledge doing the process this way. And they're doing it. And I understand SketchUp is easier to get ideas and stuff like that so that they do it so that they can be quicker. They're doing it because it's lazy also because it's quicker in the moment, but they are sacrificing the long term and all those gaps when they transfer the knowledge just for that short term game. So if somehow as a homeowner, you can piece that out or they explain it to you, 
know what you're losing. They're giving you that, that quick win, that quick thing at the expense of knowledge uh, of time, money, and knowledge loss. Yeah. So uh, I think to kind of recap, episode one was really from a higher perspective. I've just sat down on my computer. I've Googled designer uh, New York, uh, architect Colorado, whatever. And I've started my whole process of, of drilling, drilling down as a homeowner and asking questions that I might not know, know about to ask until I've listened to hopefully these two podcasts. We're in episode two. And now we're talking about what kind of, what kind of software should I be asking about my architects and designers to be using? They've, they've, they've gathered all that information. And obviously then it comes down to, again, money. So you've developed a budget. Uh, you've developed a, a proposal for your potential um, homeowner slash client. Um, Lindsay, how much of their budget project budget needs to be spent on design? How do you put that in context for them? I think if you've got healthy standards for uh, the technology requirements that you want for your project, uh, I think allocating allocating uh, 10 to 15 percent for your design professionals. Now that doesn't mean exclusively your architectural uh, needs. Uh, There's specialty designers that you need to allocate funds to. So I can get a rough layout for what the kitchen needs to be, but it might be really advantageous to hire a kitchen design specialist to work out those kind of inch decisions. And so if you're looking at the whole budget, and this is one we've, I've also wrote, written another piece about um, how much does my, uh, what's the square footage uh, cost for my project? And you can say, well, how much is a bag of groceries? It's like you, there's a bag and you're going to fill it with things, but we don't know what those things are yet. What a great analogy. Um, and that's very important because the, we keep talking about how the level of detail of your plans has a direct impact on uh, your building experience and whether it's cost effective or inefficient. Um, so to start building in um, the expectations for your design professionals and allocating funds uh, thoughtfully, like don't short change the design process, but build in healthy standards and expectations for, for each of the design professionals that you're including. I mean, I've can't tell you the invaluable layer of having a kitchen design specialist in our projects that homeowners don't want to pay for. And I'm like, you do realize that if these cabinets aren't laid out just right, you're going to have dishwashers running into garbage cans, running into refrigerators. Like this is fabrication design. And that's very different between getting a really beautiful exterior layout. So 10 to 15% uh, for your overall project um, allocation. I think. And just to rattle off a few, a few of those, if you're a homeowner listening again, the design professionals that Lindsay's talking about, architect, interior designer, uh, there could just be a general kind of designer, structural engineer, uh, kitchen designer. Um, what am I, am I missing? Uh, MEP yes. and HVAC. So the difference is, so mechanical is M, electrical um, is e. e, and then P is plumbing. Now you don't always need the, the E and P depending on your jurisdiction and what's going on. The other term that you'll hear is HVAC. And that is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Now, just know that the mechanical, sometimes the mechanical and the HVAC, you'll have to talk to your architect about which, which one to use. Because and if you're doing a traditional house with HVAC, you can go with a basically an installer that can provide manuals that calculate how much heating, ventilation, and air conditioning that you need. If you're building a house that has a pool in it and has unique materials and um, you, you need to, you know, vent it certain ways. Now you're looking at, at a mechanical engineer or, you know, if you're in the commercial space too. So I think there's five or six or seven that Lindsay is wrapping into the, to that ball to that, to that 10 to 15%. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and you can, that's where you're really going to leverage the building information model because those you're not supplying static sheets to each of those specialty designers. You're actually giving them the same immersive experience that uh, you as an owner are getting. So Tiver Belt is hired to be basically a design coordinator for each of the other specialty designers. And we're giving them the same immersive experience into your home. And they're finding really cost-effective ways to strategically lay out your heating and cooling systems. I had one scenario where 
the owners had planned for a pool, but the pool wasn't um, in the, we had created the model, the pool wasn't in the model yet. And I offhand just mentioned to the HVAC designer that they're planning on putting a pool. And he's like, well, it's a good thing you told me the reflectivity of that pool is gonna have a huge impact on the energy loads that this house has. Mm. Um, and getting that holistic, immersive experience for, e for even the specialty designers is profoundly important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other, I think an, an additional question to, to, that is going to become at the, at the conclusion of, uh, and homeowners experience in hiring, you know, a designer would be, uh, how much time do they need to be prepared to, to de dedicate to get their design developed? And obviously that changes with scope. But what, what, you know, how, how do you typically answer that for homeowners? Uh, I would say don't put artificial timelines on your process. Uh, well, what I love is many homeowners come to us early. They're like, I just need an outlet. I need a mind dump of all of the ideas that I want to do to my home. Um, but I am open to starting whenever, or we can break this up in phases and that is something that we hear a lot is, can we do phased construction? Uh, and so you can move as fast as you can allocate time to the process, but the whole point of your design professional is to extract what's in your imagination into documents that are gonna be constructed and to a finished product that you're just dancing around saying, oh my God, there's so much room for activity. It's my favorite scene in Step Brothers. Um, and, that's where it's completely homeowner driven. You know, how fast do you want to move? Yeah, that's a great way of putting it exactly. That's, and I actually had that discussion with a potential client this morning as they said, well, how, how, how quickly could you start? That's an easy one I can answer, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever. Okay, then once we start, right. how long does the process take? And I said, I, I usually, what I usually do is I give them a minimum as they say, let's say, I say everything, if everything goes perfectly and you are, on the ball, we are having meetings when we basically need to have meetings and you're making quick decisions, we can move at this pace. Uh, but I said, then I usually end it with, it can be infinite. I mean, it, almost infinite. It can expand depending on personal tragedies, financial hardship, you know, the building department, uh, who, a natural like disaster. Stop I mean, for renovation. Yep. It, 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 it's really, it really, it really goes from there. Uh, so, you know, and then, you know, so if you're a homeowner, if you're a homeowner, I think it's okay for you to demand, what is the, what is the, what is the least amount of time this could take if it went perfectly? But, but you should know that a lot of it depends on you, your speed, uh, having a, a schedule is good, is helpful and everything. But um, to really expand and kind of emphasize that point that Lindsay made, that, that great line of, your designer is there to, you, you need to extract, extract from, from, from them and push everything and all these ideas out and it's their job. So whatever that time manifestation is, th that's what it's going to be. You don't want to lose track of, you know, that special thing that, that a designer is enabling you to do. Cool. I think that was a great point. Um, I think potential homeowners have an awesome idea of what to ask, what to look forward to, um, what to see, what programs that the architects have. So that kind of sums up this episode. I think next episode, we're going to talk about you selected an architect and let's really dive into the process of going through that and what to expect in more detail and really peel back the onion on what, what's going to happen once you've engaged with an architect or a designer. So I want to thank everyone for listening for these two episodes and we hope to see you on the next one. What is up inside the firm listeners? I hope you enjoyed that very special episode uh, by the whole crew over at inside the firm, including Lindsay Pritchard Fox. Uh, it was a great episode. And um, without further ado, one of the things we need to go over is 2021. It is well underway and trade shows are still weighing physical exhibitions. So it's time to start planning how you are going to get your continuing education credits this year. ArcCAD can help. Along with manufactured products, specifications, CAD, and BIM, ArcCAD also provides a list of over 150 manufacturers with accredited courses. It's just another free resource ArcCAD provides to make your life 
a little easier. So start earning those credits at artcat.com forward slash CES. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com forward slash C-E-S. Check those guys out. They help us. If it wasn't for Arcat, we would not be here uh, producing these, this kind of content for everybody. Homeowners included, obviously, as this episode was geared towards homeowners. So please go check them out. Uh, another way you can support this podcast is if you go over to RevitRocketChip.com. That's RevitRocketChip.com. There's a free pom- promo there. You can enroll in the course. You, will get, you get taught by uh, Alex Gore of Inside the Firm. Um, he's there to help you out. We get calls all the time from firms looking to how do they, how do you transfer from AutoCAD over to or even hand drafting over to Revit? It is a difficult process for a lot of people. Um, quite honestly, the books that are written by Autodesk are or or, or its subsidiaries or even in, just independent people are I don't we don't think it's the best. Um, we think we've provided the best resource for you guys for everybody listening to help transition over to that. And so you can just go to Revit Rocket Chip dot com check that out you will help you all day long okay you you will transition you will jump on that rocket ship and you'll fly to the moon with your with your revit uh skills you'll make yourself a more productive person more productive professional and hopefully your whole firm can can follow that lead and you guys expand and 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 go out there and crush it um one other way to support this firm is to go to architectsguide2.com that's architectsguide2.com check out our brand new course, Architect to Builder. Uh, We understand that building can be extremely complicated, but our course, the Architect to Builder course, helps reduce your frustration, provides a clear roadmap with helpful resources to take you from pencil to profit. So check it out over at Architects Guide 2. That's architectsguide2.com. Check that out today. We think you'll love it. We think you'll love it. And last, but certainly... Uh, not least, uh, if thanks for listening for today's episode. We we appreciate all the listeners out there. We are nearing some some big numbers. We keep increasing every month. Um, we love this community that we that we've uh, you guys have helped us build. If without you guys, we wouldn't be here at all. So really appreciate your support. And if you didn't already know, inside the firm is now has a YouTube channel. Obviously, if you're watching YouTube, you're seeing me right now, and you've already seen the other episode. So you can actually watch that episode if you if that's what you prefer. I prefer watching YouTube episodes. I love YouTube YouTube episodes. So subscribe now, and if you if you subscribe, you'll have a chance to win a piece of Inside the Firm merch. That's sort of a whole year long thing that we are trying to promote here since we launched the channel uh, a couple months ago. Or if you prefer podcast style, it would mean the world to us if you could leave us a five star review. For us, if you enjoyed the episode, that's how more people will find the podcast, how we can help spread more value and keep building with this, with this architect community uh, that is, that is so precious and valuable um, to everything, everything that we're trying to, trying to accomplish here. Uh, but no matter which category you fall into, whether it's YouTube or, or listening terrestrially on a pod over podcast app that you're using, if you're looking for the latest updates on Inside the Firm and special content, follow us on LinkedIn or Facebook at Inside the Firm or Instagram at ITF podcast. Thank you for joining us for another great episode.